This episode is brought to you by PopCultureZone.com. For all your cleaning and pressing needs and as low as $5.99 a book, be sure to check them out. With over 8,000 books cleaned and pressed, PopCultureZone.com. What's going on guys, it's Brian and Jack, and in this video we're going to add to that master list of back issues. We're giving you another top 10 back issues to be on the lookout for, right? That's right, this isn't a burn and turn list. We're going to keep stacking these things up and building on them from week to week. We're not only going to highlight 10 books that you need to be on the lookout for that are sure to be moving in the future, but we're also going to talk about what trends we're liking right now and what movement within the market we're seeing happening in the future. So stay tuned, we got a great list this week. Brian, let's get into it, my man. Coming at the bottom of the list this week, we have Spider-Man number one. This is that great Todd McFarlane goodness. Yes, it's printed a lot, but nonetheless, it's still a classic issue and one everyone should have in their collection. Right. This is a book I love putting on the list because it's very much like X-Men number one from 1991, a book that, you know, you're going to hear about it being overprinted because it really was one of those books that was setting records at the time for it, its print run. But all these years later, how many homages have been done to this exact design? How important has Todd McFarlane become to kind of the legacy, not just of Spider-Man, but of Marvel Comics and these cover art in general? Um, on top of it, like this is what started his kind of view of spider webbing and control. He controlled this versus his run on Amazing Spider-Man, which is why I'm really partial to this, this Todd McFarlane Spider-Man run on top of it. I've seen this firsthand, Brian, selling at conventions over the last few years. This is something that you and I have talked about. There's a younger generation of collectors, and there are certain books that when they enter the hobby, they have to get that I think you and I take it up for granted because we've already got them. And this book is one of them. Whether it's the polybagged version, whether they want it unbagged and graded, whether they want that black and silver version, or they want that kind of bronze version. Yeah. Either way, um, people are excited to chase this book. This is a book that uh, new collectors, when they come into the hobby, they feel like they have to have. Gorgeous McFarlane cover art, iconic Spider-Man. And, and it's going to be tough to own an amazing Spider-Man number one, a lot easier to own Spider-Man number one. Yeah, even if it's not for like the investment portion, it's just nice to say I have a Spider-Man number one in my collection. And you hit the nail on the head there because it's a crossover between having Spider-Man and then having a classic artist of that time in Todd McFarlane. No one can deny that. It's a great issue. That's why it comes in at number 10 on the list this week. Moving into that next spot, we're sticking with that Spider-Verse, but we're going with Spider-Gwen issues number 24 and 25. These are pretty important issues, wouldn't you say? That's right, because I think if we're going to talk about Spider-Gwen, we're going to have to at some point figure out who is her arch nemesis, who is that main villain. And just like with Spider-Man, there's no villain that kind of took people by storm more than Venom. So, of course, we're coming with Gwenom here. Cover 24 and 25 to kind of give you a little bit of both. You kind of see that Venomization taking over with issue 24. And 25, you get that cover reveal uh, of Gwenum. There's a lenticular cover for 25. Um, there's some variants that do very well. Now these are in demand, regularly going for about $20 for 24, uh, around 10 to 12 for 25. But I really think that's just the beginning because as I said, as Spider Gwen grows, I think these will grow. And I think they're also ones that every now and again, you can kind of find under the radar. So we're not going to play into that cameo versus first full appearance argument. What we always say is hedge your bets, grab both. Yeah. Also, Jack, I think you need to have a chat with your neighbors and let them know that they don't need to be speeding out of the parking lot the way they are. <laughs> right, right, right. That's what we got speed bumps for. <laughs> So heading us at the number eight spot, we're going all the way to the beginning of that series with Spider-Gwen number one. Right, and we talked about Edge of the Spider-Verse, and we've talked about the late prints in a, in a previous episode of these top ten lists. And, you know, the Edge of the Spider-Verse, the first print and the incentive, they're starting to price out of the average buyer's range, especially these new collectors coming in. And these new collectors are impacted by Spider-Gwen more than any other collector, especially the new young female collectors. And I've seen that firsthand because I got two little ones living in another room in my house. So this is one of those things where as 
that first appearance gets tough. It's a theme that we've talked about. It's a theme we're going to continue to talk about. This isn't the only time on this list that we're going to talk about it. But Spider Gwen number one uh, from 2015, I think it's it's that first volume. It's one to really be on the lookout for. You also got to remember, Edge of Spider Verse number two was intended to be a one shot. It was just a kind of almost what if story. And uh, get you one day we'll go into the details on the channel of how that story, how that book came to be with the creator Jason Latour, but. Uh, it really wasn't intended to be more than just that one book. So this first volume even, of the, uh, it gives you kind of the whole backstory of the character, and that's where you're getting into it. There's world building. There's first appearances of characters within her universe. So there's a lot of value here, and it's one for sure to pay attention to, undervalued. And it's funny because you talk about that what if type. It kind of ties into that, the Hawkeye number zero. Yep. But with the people in cosplay but either way also we're talking about spider gwen number one we're talking about that cover a we know there's some great variants out there for this we like to keep it basic that way people can add these to your collection a little bit more attainable but nonetheless still great pickups and to add to your collection as well coming in next on the list we've talked on the channel before and people have talked about in the comic community about the possibility of dc marvel merger but here we have one that's kind of a great piece of treasure and we're talking about Stan Lee in that DC Just Imagine one-shot series, right? Yeah, it's time to talk about this, Brian, because when you and I were growing up getting into comics and then kind of getting into uh, kind of our 20s and so on and so forth, this was kind of a laughed-at series, right? Uh, essentially almost kind of a failed attempt. This was, um, you know, Stan Lee at a point where he was no longer working with Marvel, and it was kind of an experiment, similar to what we saw with Heroes Were Born with Marvel, where what if DC brought him in and they had him kind of recreate the characters of DC comics kind of in his own uh, vein, kind of the style that he is accustomed to. So a lot of diversity, um, a lot of alliteration with the names. Um, and this series ends, ends up being one where you, you get essentially 12 individualized one shots, starting with Stan Lee's Just Imagine Batman um, and ending with an epic event uh, where we get the, the main villain revealed as well as um, kind of an, an entire group. If you don't like the individualized stories, I promise you it pays off at the end. So for, from a reader perspective, if you haven't gotten a chance to read the trade, I think it's a great read. But it's also important because we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of this. And we're getting to a point where we talk about the generational change in comics where there's new people coming into the hobby who may not even realize that Stan Lee created a Batman, a Flash, a Green Lantern. Um, and these are books that I think, much like Spider-Man number one, that a previous generation may have overlooked, may have undervalued, may have ostracized even, that a younger generation will simply see as cool and something that they want to add to their PC. Stan is no longer with us, but he is eternal, and he is a part of our hobby forever. And this is very cool to me. You know, he's known for his Marvel work, but this is his one foray into DC Comics. It's a lot like when a great player ends his career with another team. Uh, it's always an interesting footnote, and we always know that jersey's valid as well. Yep, and then they sign that one-day contract with the original team to retire. And very much what Stan did. Coming in the middle of the list at number six, but we get another twofer. We're talking about Final Crisis number seven and Action Comics number nine from the New 52. Yeah, and here we're talking about Calvin Ellis. Now, if you're sitting there going, Calvin Ellis, who the hell is that? Well, that's the Earth 23 Superman. Now, why are we talking about a Superman from another Earth? Well, this character created by Grant Morrison is the character that was rumored for a long time to be in discussion for a feature film starring Michael B. Jordan. This is, of course, the African-American Superman that is largely based um, upon President Barack Obama. There's been a lot of push for the, to see this character on the big screen. Um, and this is a first appearance that's just sitting there, Brian, available for cheap um, that I, I look at and go, you know, this movie may never happen. Um, no matter how much Michael B. Jordan or the studio may want it. But at the prices that it's sitting at, how can you kind of not take a look at it? Uh, Final Crisis uh, 7 is the first appearance. It, it, cover A is usually the affordable one. You'll see $3, 4 5 $6. 
There's a variant with Superman on the cover, the Superman icon variant. That one tends to be about $15, but still, both of them extremely cheap. The reason we bring up Action Comics number nine, it is literally the only other issue ever featuring Calvin Ellis. And he's featured on the cover. Uh, it, this entire issue is essentially a Calvin Ellis story. And you see, when you see the cover of nine, it's very, very clear that, that there's a Barack Obama inspiration with that cover. And there's another thing to note about this cover that really I find interesting, Brian. Not only is this the first book where he's actually named Calvin Ellis and we know who he is and where he comes from and we get his origin, but there's those combo pack variants. Remember those that everybody wanted to chase that featured the digital codes. But also there is a one in 200 sketch variant for this. Imagine that, 200 copies of Action Comics 9. I found one copy available that sold a couple months ago and it only sold for $40, but I could not find a copy anywhere on the internet, eBay, anywhere. And this, that's one that I think could be one to grab because certainly there can't be many of those floating around. The other thing about action comics number nine for people that, that does matter to some of them is you get a lot of those first appearance of those classic characters in like the new 52. Then coming in at number five on the list, we're talking about Thanos 13, but we're talking about the later printings on this one. Everyone knows the regular cover. Everyone knows about the Albuquerque variant, but a lot of these later printings get overlooked, I believe. Yeah, Brian, sometimes logic doesn't make sense to me when it comes to the comic buying community. So think about what we saw with Null, right? Those Null late printings became very popular because they were the first cover appearance of Null. And we've seen first cover appearances spike before. But I immediately asked the question, why doesn't that happen with other first appearance, first cover appearances in late printings? One prime example, also a Donny Cates creation, that was also the same level of heat, the same level of demand when it came out, is Cosmic Ghost Rider. He first appears here in uh, issue number 13. The covers, you, you do not see him depicted, especially prevalently. And then you get that kind of throughout the uh, late printings, you get that, that kind of co cover appearance reveal um, that is shown later in the book. This is kind of the era that started the late printings using uh, popular kind of like panel imaging at, as cover art. Uh, and, and it may sold extremely well, but we, they've, those books have taken off to an extent, right? Like they're $10, $12 yeah, books. Yeah, when, when I say overlooked, they weren't overlooked during the, the, the Cosmic Ghost Rider hype, but we also talk about that yeah. cycle where it's kind of come down a little bit. They haven't hit that second level while the first print continues to gain steadily in value quietly, right? It, the first print hasn't dropped, hasn't, hasn't tipped off. We've even seen like Marvel Legends put out a, a uh, figure uh, of Cosmic Ghost Rider came with the bike that was extremely popular, got a lot of people's attention. So I think Cosmic Ghost Rider isn't going anywhere. Donny Cates has done a lot of talking about Cosmic Ghost Rider showing up in a uh, live action film. I can't put anything past Marvel and Kevin Feige at, you know, it, we've seen Frank Castle and we've seen Ghost Rider. Um, so maybe the best way to do both of those characters is Cosmic Ghost Rider. We'll have to see, but these are late printings. That Bernthal. I <laughs> these are late printings that I think um, if you just look at the value and you compare them to where say Spider Gwen or Null or some of these other kind of like similarly comparable characters are, um, you know, he, Cosmic Ghost Rider seems to be lagging behind. And to me, that gives potential for profit. Then hitting the list at number four this week, we get the boys number seven. There's another topic that we discussed on this channel quite often before. You get a lot of people picking up this issue number one, but especially with indie comics, a lot of times you see first appearances of new characters trickled out throughout the issues. And number seven is one of those, isn't it, Jack? Yeah, it's not even trickled with the boys, though. The boys has a very unique style of bringing you into the story. If you've seen the show, essentially, the point where you are meeting the seven in the show does not happen until issue seven. So the seven, which is so much of what that show is, we're talking about from, you know, the all of those those characters, Homelander, The Deep, every single one of them that, uh, you know, these kind of Charlton style characters that take from G.I. Joe and DC Comics and Marvel Comics, they, they all start with it, that issue number seven. And Starlight, who's kind of like a, one of our co-leads in the show, right? She first appears 
in issue seven. We've been talking about this for a while because I think it's one of the most under-recognized and underutilized things. It, there's kind of a plug-and-play concept when it comes to independent comics where people jump on issue number one. They think that's the only issue they ever have to pay attention to. Uh, I, issue number one has its value, right? There's certainly characters in there that first appear. Um, both of our protagonists first appear in issue number one. It's also the first appearance, right, of the title in general, The Boys. But I could argue seven is more important than number one. And another reason why this became important, again, is, you know, previews just solicited a whole nother round of solicitations for final order cutoff, right? And we're looking through the comics, Brian, and you know what I noticed? The t-shirt section. They're putting two t-shirts out right now ahead of the boys season two. They're putting a t-shirt that features the cover for issue number one. But they're also putting a t-shirt out that features the cover to issue number seven. So I think there's going to be some movement in the market for this issue number seven as people start to realize i think this is the most important book in the entire series yeah not to mention like there's kind of a lull in it right now but as soon as that trailer hits for that new season people are going to start going hunting again absolutely we are down to the bottom three right now and coming in at number three we have Justice League number 40 from the New 52. This is one of my favorite story arcs in all the comics. I'm a big Jeff Johns fan, but we get Justice League number 40. I was just asked in a Facebook group, hey, if you could have any live action movie for a comic arc, what would it be? Dark Side War was my answer, and this kicks that off. Dark Side War was fabulous, and then this hits on another um, one of the trends we talked about. We talked about world building. We've talked about that on several different um, programs here on the Simpleman's Comics YouTube channel. Grail gave a very natural major enemy for Wonder Woman. Uh, just a very, very natural enemy, kind of what Dark Side essentially is to Superman. Grail can be for Wonder Woman. I like that. I think that there's so much potential with Grail. Also, we've seen the success of children of major characters, especially children of big bads. And Darkseid's as big and bad as they get. Um, and Grail comes from a totally different perspective. We're definitely got that vibe of a big bad, but also, you know, a very attractive female, certainly marketable character. Justice League 40 was one of those hit you out of left field issues. Um, and then it, it, it spiked on the secondary market. It's kind of come back down to earth some. A lot of people pay attention to that one in 25 variant. That book was hurt by one of those diamond clearance sales where diamond, that book had skyrocketed and then diamond cleared out a bunch of old inventory for very cheap, affected the prices of it. I think that variant is still a good buy. The combo pack of that book is a very tough find, but really I like cover a, I think that's the most affordable. I think that the character is where the money is and that's a good pickup, but if you're grabbing this book, I would also grab that free comic book day issue to go with it because it did feature a preview that showed Grail front and center prior to her appearing in Justice League 40. Now, I'm in the kind of the opinion that a preview could be a first appearance, could be not, kind of depends on what the market says. The market has kind of deemed it on the fence, so I say grab them both. And then coming in the second to top spot this week, we get Convergence Aquaman number two. Yeah, and you know what? We had a nice little segue there because we were talking previews, right? That's what we're talking about right now. We are talking about a preview for the new Dr. Fate series that debuted in the new 52. Now, why is this important? Well, that's because that's the first appearance of Khalid Nassar. Now, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that wrong, but he is the most modern Dr. Fate before we got a new one this week in Legion of Superheroes number six. But he is the favorite to appear in the upcoming film series, which will feature Shazam, Black Adam, Hawkman, Hawkgirl, um, and kind of rightfully so, as racially speaking, he sort of fits in with kind of that Egyptian vibe. I think it's, it's kind of course correcting possibly maybe some mistakes in um, the past. So I think that this is the kind of Dr. Fate to invest in, especially with some of those earlier Dr. Fate appearances. We're talking old appearances, expensive. This seems to be the most likely bet. On top of it, we've already seen issue number one spike to ungodly numbers. But I really think people are not aware that this book exists. In the back of this Convergence Aquaman number two book, there is a multi-page preview of Dr. Fate number one. Khaled Nassar is featured right there in the book. Uh, so you have a first appearance right there. You have a cover A and a cover B by Chip Kid. These 
Convergence books were widely panned. And the Aquaman one is one of those ones that you're talking about a series that wasn't successful and then a character that was less successful within the series. Um, I don't think there's a ton of these out there. And it's like everything else. Once people are aware of this, this is going to be the book to get between this and Dr. Fate number one. Grab it while nobody is talking about it. And we've already seen these types of books play out extremely well. We saw with, with uh, Convergence, uh, Superman number two. And now I think we can see it with this Aquaman book as well. Then coming in at our top spot, our number one spot for the top 10 back issue for this week is Ultimate Comics all new Spider-Man number one. Now that cover may look familiar to you, but we're not talking about previews. These are no free catalogs here. We're talking comic books, sequential art, the real deal. And this is a book, Brian, I think is getting overlooked right now. It's hard to say overlooked when we're talking miles, right? Look at what, look at what that previews 95 book is doing. Look at what is going on right now with Ultimate Fallout 4 and its variants and its late printings. Look at what, PS5 and Sony just announced with the upcoming Miles Morales video game. We know Into the Spider-Verse 2 is coming. There's talk of Sony live action Miles. Everything seems to be headed in the direction of Miles Morales. You have a very limited window at this point to get in on anything Miles. And we've seen two th key things I saw spike with the kind of most recent round of Miles news. We saw Ultimate Fallout, Ultimate Fallout 4 spike again, and we alerted you guys through these lists to those late printings well prior to them spiking. But now we want to talk to you about this again. Same concept. As a first appearance begins to price people out of the market, they tend to go to that issue number one. Miles first appeared in issue number four, but this is really his first full foray into the comics. This is really where you get Miles as Spider-Man. Um, and I think that this is a massively, massively undervalued book. This is a, the book that I regularly find those white polybag copies in dollar bins, $3 bins. Um, it was, yes, heavily produced. Yes, a lot of people had the variants, but you've already seen the incentives dry up. Uh, and they've start, while they used to not go for much, they have started to already rise in price. When you see variants rise in price and dry up, you are almost certain to see the regular covers follow suit. It just takes them longer for them to dry up because of the abundance of supply. But this is one of those things to me, Brian, blue chip, no brainer. Miles Morales is as big as it gets. We could probably go 10 deep with different Miles Morales books that all have a good chance of spiking down in the future. But I, I don't understand if Ultimate Fallout 4 is the book to get and then people want to jump to the more modern stuff. I think they're omitting this book where we really got to know who Miles is and what makes him so great and why we love him to this day. Yeah, I think you make a good point. I think, like you said, as you see Ultimate Fallout 4 dry up, you see the second print that we talked about on earlier parts of this list, that's escalating right now. As those books start to dry up, you're going to see that domino effect of, like you mm. said, people are going to go out getting Miles. Their attention span is going to come on this, especially with the attention of the previews, 90, the previews not that edition that we're talking about with that, the cover of this on it. But sooner or later, this is going to pick up, so get in early before people are aware of it and start grabbing those issues up as well. So there it is, guys. There's our 10 back issues to be on the lookout for this week. Add those to your collections. This one was a great list because some of these lists we've had, we've had some books that are kind of heftier in price. I think this one was a more affordable list, more under, I won't say undervalued, but overlooked on a lot of these issues. Yeah, I would agree. I, I'm going to tell you a little spoilers coming for the next couple of weeks. We got a couple of weeks like that, Brian. We got a couple of weeks where we're going to be hitting you guys out there in the Simple Men's Comics YouTube family with some undervalued keys, some books that we think are going to rise, but they're also books that are affordable and will allow everybody to kind of play within that uh, that realm. We've talked about this, that we, we were looking at all of these books as books to, to spike in the future. Even when we're focusing on books that are 60 to $100, they have that potential, but we understand not everybody can pay that to play. So we've got a little something for everybody. And I agree with you. I like that about this list. Yeah, so we'll also have this full list over at simplemenscomics.com with links to these books for available copies on eBay. Again, those are affiliate links and that money helps support this channel. And we also have that book of that first 10 list, those hunt over 100 books that we talked about. There's that ebook out there on the website right now. You can get that for $1.95. If you don't want to do the $1.95, all the previous articles, all the previous lists are over at simplemenscomics.com as well. You just have to search for them. But with that being said, 
This is Brian Jack for Some Men's Comics. We'll see you guys in the next video.